We're glad to be sharing the ministry of Redemption Church with you. Now join us as we receive the Word of God. Excellent. You can be seated in this house. We're so glad to have everybody here with us. We have a friend that might be watching all the way from Russia today. Or no, Germany. Germany. His name is George. George, if you are tuning in with us, go ahead and say hi. God bless you from Plano, Texas. And my friend over here, Tony, we're so glad to have you, Tony. Everybody say hi, Tony. We're so glad everybody's here. If you don't know, my name is Chris Fluitt, and this is Redemption Church in Plano, Texas. And we're in a sermon series called After Life. There is an afterlife. There is an afterlife, and everyone thinks about it. Christians and non-Christians alike, they all think about the afterlife, and everyone asks this question, what comes after? What comes after? There is an afterlife, and I can get y'all to say amen about it, but do we really understand the afterlife? Usually when we talk about the afterlife, you think of two words. You think about heaven, and you think about hell, all right? Well, often you, you hear a preacher say something like this. Raise your hand if you've ever heard this. If you died today, where would you spend eternity? Have you ever heard of a preacher said that? Yes, I've heard that. It's very effective. By the way, it's gotten a lot of people to make a decision for, for following Jesus, and we don't put that down at all. But, but there's a, a, a weirdness about that question, because do we understand eternity? Do we really understand what happens after we die and everything that takes place? Do we just go to heaven or are there other things? Do we really understand the afterlife? I believe that Christians today know less about the afterlife than Christians in ages past. I believe that. I think it's because the church doesn't preach enough about this subject. The church preaches more about how to have a good life here and now Uh instead of laying up treasures in heaven. Now, y'all don't have to amen me, but that's my opinion on the fact there, Leroy. Jesus taught us to focus more on heavenly, eternal treasures rather than earthly treasures. He said it in Matthew 6, beginning at verse 19. It says, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moths and vermin destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourself yes, treasures in heaven, where moths and vermin do not destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. According to Jesus, he believes that right here today, we could store up treasures. In heaven, I take Jesus literally. Do you take Jesus literally? He believes that today you can store up a treasure that no moth can get to, no vermin can nibble on, nobody can ever steal. I want to tell you that God cares about your life on earth. He absolutely does. But he has a better life for you after this one. So set your mind on the things of heaven. Set your heart on heaven because where your treasure is, that's where your heart will be also. Where is your treasure? Place it in heaven. Do you have questions about the afterlife? We have a, an anonymous text line. It's at 214-856-0550. We've gotten a few texts in there that we've tried to reach out to. So thank you for that. If you've got any questions about what we preach today or any other questions, if you really want to know, do dog, do all dogs actually go to heaven? Like that movie. That's, no one knows that. That's a movie. Sorry, from the 80s is cartoon. If you've got questions like that, please text us. It's an anonymous text line. No one will know uh, who they're talking to, but they will try to answer you either here or in the sermon. We want to provide uh, question, answers to your questions, and we'll do our best to answer and also to continue the conversation. All right. I want to remind you that the afterlife is a lot more than just heaven and hell. We're building an afterlife timeline, and there is a lot more than just heaven 
or hell that takes place on this timeline. Last week we told you about the, starts with an R. The rapture, all right, good. If no one said it, we were gonna have to preach it all over again. So good save, Sarah, it's good. Last week we told you about the rapture, that's the catching away. The rapture is a biblical teaching where believers will rise from earth to meet Jesus in the air. And many Christians disagree on when the rapture will take place. But few biblical Christians disagree that there will be a rapture. Most people that read their Bible see very clearly that the rapture is a biblical teaching. When you are taken in the rapture, at that moment, you're going to step into the afterlife. So if you want to know when the afterlife is, it starts at the moment someone is taken in the rapture. They step into eternity right at that moment. You will be changed and you will be given a new glorified body. That's what Paul taught us in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Jesus is coming back. He's not just coming back for anybody. He's coming back for a bride. And he's coming back for a prepared bride. And we must make ourselves ready for his return. So this is the question, right? Everyone asks, when is the rapture? Scripture says no man knows the day or the hour. We talked about that last week. Go check that out. But scripture is clear that the rapture is going to center around a period of time called the tribulation. Say tribulation. tribulation. That's the bulk of what we're going to talk about today is the tribulation. Are you ready to preach with me today? All right. The tribulation is a period of time foretold in Bible prophecy. Not just a few scriptures talk about it, a lot of scripture talks about it. We've got Old Testament prophets that talk about it. We've got Jesus himself that talks about it. We've got apostles in the New Testament that talk about it. And we've got the book of Revelation that talks about it. I believe in the tribulation. In the books of Daniel and also in the book of Revelation, it speaks about two, three and a half periods three and a half year periods that will come at the end time. What is three and a half plus three and a half? Seven. Seven. Very good. Very good. The first three and a half years is actually called the tribulation. And the second three and a half years is actually called the great tribulation. Together, they make seven years of tribulation. The tribulation is a seven year time period. It is seven years Exactly. Not seven years, kind of. Not nearly seven years. Almost a few days short. No, it actually numbers seven complete years to the day. When people ask when the rapture will take place, they are really asking where in relation to the tribulation is the rapture. And so there are three major viewpoints. We'll hit them very quickly. There's the pre-tribulation rapture, where Jesus takes us before the tribulation. Really rooting for that one, very much. All right, then there is the mid-tribulation, which it it occurs somewhere within the seven-year period. And then uh, the post-tribulation, where the rapture happens after the seven-year tribulation. Are you following that? We've got pre, we've got mid We've got posts. These are the prevailing uh, theories from people that read their Bible. What do I believe? It's it's a good question because it changes every once in a while. It is a confusing subject. Uh, I I kind of hover between pre and mid. Right now, you caught me on a day where I'm feeling kind of pre. I'm feeling kind of pre-tribulation today. This is honestly how I feel about it. Let's look at our timeline. The next thing to occur could be a pre-tribulation rapture. The very next thing to occur. It could happen today. If it's pre-tribulation, it could happen this moment. It could happen. The very next thing that could happen is a pre-tribulation rapture. If you want to be counted in that number, you need to get your life ready. Everyone says ready. Ready. 
But perhaps, if it's not a pre-tribulation rapture, perhaps the next thing that happens in this biblical timeline ahead of us, prophesied of, would be a seven-year tribulation. If it's not a pre-tribulation rapture, then you would be looking at the tribulation happening and then the rapture would come either somewhere in the middle of that or at the end of that. Am I making sense to everybody? All right, excellent. This is something that a lot of Christians like to argue about. We're not going to get bogged down in it today. Everyone said amen. Amen. Daniel chapter 12, verse 1. It says, at that time, Michael, who's Michael? He's an archangel. Michael, the archangel. The great prince who protects your people will arise. There will be a time of trouble. Everyone said trouble. Trouble. Such as Uh, has never happened from the beginning of nations until then. But at that time, your people, everyone whose name is found written in the book, will be delivered. This is speaking of the tribulation. It is a time of trouble. Everyone said tribulation, trouble. Trouble in this world is not exactly new. Is that a revelation for you? Anybody? Okay, is that a revelation? Trouble's not new. He said, Jesus told us, in this world you will have trouble. trouble. That word is actually tribulation. In this world you will have tribulation. This great tribulation that's coming, it's not going to be the first time you face tribulation. Right? So what kind of tribulation are we talking about here? What kind of trouble are we talking about? Jesus says these words in Matthew chapter 24. You want to read about uh, the end We'll read Matthew 24. Jesus tells us a lot in that chapter. Beginning at verse 21, we're going to read, For then there will be great distress, unequaled from the beginning of the world until now, and never to be equaled again. If those days had not been cut short, no one would survive. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be shortened. The tribulation will be a time of unprecedented trouble. Jesus declares, this is a heavy thing Jesus says, if those days had not been cut short, no one would survive. Is Jesus being literal here? Yes, I believe he's absolutely 100% literal. That there is a time coming that is so difficult. The greatest Christian you know. Anybody got that picture of a great Christian they know? Oh my goodness. My grandmother was just this great. You've got these pictures. Some people had pictures like Billy Graham came to mind. Whatever your picture of a great person of God is. I'm telling you. He's, Jesus is talking about them. They wouldn't make it through the tribulation. Except that God shortened the days. So that they someone would survive. So who believes the tribulation is a pretty bad thing, right? How about it's the worst thing? Would you even say that? There's nothing like it. According to Jesus, nothing like it before, nothing like it after. The prophet Isaiah, uh, sorry, the prophet Jeremiah prophesied the same 600 years earlier. Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 3. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will bring back, bring my people, Israel and Judah, back from captivity and restore them to the land I gave their ancestors to possess, says the Lord. These are the words the Lord spoke concerning Israel and Judah. This is what the Lord says. Get ready. Cries of fear are heard. Terror, not peace. Ask and see. Can a man bear children? Then why do I see every strong man with his hands on his stomach like a woman in labor? Every face turned deathly pale. How awful that day will be. No other will be like it. It will be a time of trouble for Jacob. When it says Jacob there, it means Israel. A time of trouble for Israel, for Jacob but he will be saved out of it. Now, is Jeremiah talking about the same thing Jesus is? Yes. Yes, he is. He absolutely is. 
jump back to the words of Jesus in Matthew 24. Now we're going earlier in that chapter, verse 3. As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives. This is not the Sermon of the Mount. This is actually what people call the Passion Week. This is the last week of his life. It, the, this week ends with him going into a grave. And it starts the next week with him coming out of it. All right. The disciples came to him privately. Tell us, they said, when will this happen? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Jesus answered, watch out that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name, claiming I am the Messiah and will deceive many. You will hear of wars and rumors of wars, but see to it that you are not alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of birth pains. Everyone said birth pains. What a strange thing to say. What a strange thing to say, except that's exactly what Jesus meant to say. Like Jeremiah, Jesus also likens the tribulation to a pregnancy labor pain. Jeremiah says, can a man have a child? Can a man have a baby? Then why are they walking around with their hands over their stomach like they're about to give birth? Do you see this? This is not a mistake. Because this prophetic utterance about the tribulation is about what it brings forth. When you start having labor pains, Jessica Blessing, you could tell us if this is true. I know you know that when you start feeling those pains, it's getting your body ready to give birth. This tribulation is getting the world ready for something new, a new life to come into the world. Do you follow this? Do you see this in Scripture? Jesus lists these terrible things, right? Deception, false Christs everywhere, wars, rumors of wars, famines, and pestilence. Any examples of pestilence nowadays? There's a little virus from Wuhan, China that has swept over the entire world. It's everywhere. If that ain't pestilence, what is? And then he says, these are just the beginning of birth pains. That's just the beginning. So here's a great question. It might be a question that you've asked. It's a question that came in on the text line great. Are we in the tribulation now? Are we in the tribulation now? That's a great question. It's an important question. As I'm speaking on August 30, 2020, we are not in the seven-year tribulation right now. I believe that. I believe that. Here's why I believe that. In the tribulation, there's going to be antichrist and a false prophet. We don't see them yet, okay? There will be a one-world government does, well, it's, it's forming. It's trying. I can see where it wants to, but it's not here yet, right? There will be a one world religion. It's a one world currency. Everybody's looking at the change thing and all that stuff. Like, I'm, I'm paying attention. Don't be fearful, but pay attention, y'all. There will be signs and plagues. There will be severe persecution for all who believe in Christ in the tribulation. The Antichrist will form a seven-year peace treaty with Israel. That seven years is, is actually what the time period of the tribulation will be. The nation of Israel will be deceived by the Antichrist and then wake up and turn back to its Messiah, Jesus Christ, and receive him like they should have received him 2,000 years ago. In the very middle of the seven years, you can act, it's so accurate, you can put your watch to it. In the very middle of the seven years, the Antichrist himself is going to stand in Jerusalem in the temple of the Jews 
in the holy place and he is going to sacrifice unto himself as God himself and demand worship. All of these things are going to happen. There is not yet a temple in Jerusalem. So we cannot yet be in the tribulation. Do you follow me? Yes. The tribulation ends with the Savior returning to conquer Satan. Can we give it up for Jesus? Yes. He's coming back. Yes. And he wins this thing. He conquers Satan and his armies. He rescues Israel as at a battle known as Armageddon. These things have not yet happened, so we are not right now in the tribulation. However, remember that Jesus gave us this list of bad things. Wars, rumors of wars, famine, earthquake, pestilence. And then Jesus says that those things are the beginning of of birth pains. We're not in the tribulation, but we could be absolutely in the precursor to the tribulation. This could be God's way of alerting us. Sound the alarm. Be alert, right? When we have a, a disease going all around the world and Christians aren't even able to meet together, forget the conspiracy theories out there. Get a hold of God. Be alert to such things, all right? Is that all right? Whether or not we are days or decades away from the tribulation, here is reason to believe we are headed towards the tribulation. You, I'm talking about you. Yeah, you. You have this reoccurring thought. I know you have it. Here it is. Y'all tell me if I'm wrong. Here it is. The world is getting worse. Y'all have that thought? Everybody have that thought? Am I the only one? Y'all have that on the internet. You have that thought? It's not because of a lack of technology. The world's getting worse and we got more technology than ever before. It's not because of a lack of personal freedom. We are in the most free country ever. Ever. You got more freedom than anywhere else on the face of the planet. And guess what? It's still getting worse. Oh, well, we'll get a little political here. Wait a second. It's not because of the previous presidential administration or the current presidential administration that it's getting worse. Regardless of what they say, right? That's, every, that's their whole position. They did it. They did it. Washington, D.C., everyone. That's, that's them, right? I want to tell you, it's getting worse, but it's not because of our political decisions why it's getting worse. It's not because we lack the resources, the wealthiest nation in the world. It's not because we lack the time. Everyone has the same 24 hours in a day. It's not that we lack the energy or the money. It is clear that the world is getting worse. It is clear that the world is not becoming a better place. Jesus told us that as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be at his coming, the coming of the Son of Man. Matthew 24, 37, he said that. Well, let's look back at what the days of Noah were like. Genesis 6 and 5, the Lord saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on the earth. And that every inclination, every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil all the time. Woo, that's tough. Now listen, I would say that we are moving closer and closer to that way of thinking. I just do. I believe that we are... We, we are heading towards that place where every thought will be to do evil. And that will be what it's like when Jesus Christ comes back. Right. And I don't need to read you stats on human trafficking, right? For you to know it's real bad. I don't need to read you uh, stats on poverty and greed, right? 
for you to know it's rampant in our society. Do I need to read you stats on murder, on corruption, on human rights violations, on drugs, depression, and suicide? Do I have to read you stats for you to realize, hey, man, it's getting worse out there. It's getting worse out there. We live, we live in Plano, y'all. Plano's a wonderful town. I love Plano. But, but it's, it's getting scary out there, even in Plano, Texas. A woman just went out for a jog in the nice part of town. The nice part of town. She did not make it home in the morning. She was killed less than a mile from here on our jogging trails right here in beautiful, pristine Plano, Texas. Listen, y'all, I'm telling you, it's getting worse. It's getting worse. Somebody say it's getting worse. If you think the world is bad now, you do not want to see the tribulation. Jeremiah and Jesus prophesied it would be a time worse than any other before or after. Someone said tribulation trouble. The book of Revelation tells us that while the Antichrist is on earth ruling the nations, he is killing people that don't take his mark. He is demanding that everybody worships him. He's doing all kinds of evil atrocity. If there was ever a person that only thought evil all the time, it's going to be this dude, Satan incarnate, the Antichrist. While that is happening on the earth, something's happening in heaven. You listen, something is happening in heaven at that very moment. There is a lamb in heaven with a scroll. The scroll, let me tell you about the scroll. The scroll has seven seals on it. They would put seals, wax seals on it. And you had to have the authority to open the seal and then open up the scroll. This scroll had how many seals? Seven, Seven seals. And it says in your Bible that all of heaven wept. You heard there's no tears in heaven. All of heaven wept. Why did they weep? Because no one was worthy. No one had the authority to take this scroll and loose it seals. But then a lamb shows up. A lamb who had been slain but is alive. Woo! Come on, somebody. And they see this lamb and he has the authority. And that's where they sing, worthy is the lamb to take the scroll and to open up the seals. The lamb appears and all of heaven turns from weeping to worshiping the lamb. And they all declare Jesus Christ worthy. Earth, we are behind the schedule. Jesus is worthy. Worthy, and we need to declare him worthy. Praise the Lord, he has all authority in his hand. He says, In heaven, Jesus takes the scroll and he breaks the first seal. Everyone said, The first seal. And as he breaks that seal in heaven, on earth, a judgment is unleashed. The first judgment is actually the Antichrist himself. I want you to understand this. You listen right here. The Antichrist thinks he's so bad. Yeah. Satan thinks he's so bad. Let me tell you, he can't even show up until Jesus breaks the first seal. What a loser. Who's the Antichrist? I don't know, but he's a loser. My gosh. So he breaks that first seal and that judgment is unleashed on the earth. And the scroll has seven seals. And each time Jesus breaks a seal, a terrible judgment happens on the earth. There is warfare like never before. There is a famine like never before. There is death like never before. There will be natural calamities like never before. Earthquakes, the sun turning black. There's even a thing where mountains and islands disappear. Poof, they're gone. Wow. With every seal broken in heaven, 
something breaks out on earth, the likes of which we have never seen. The breaking of the seven seals is spread out. I don't actually have a scripture that says this, but, but walk with me. I'm going to try to explain this. It, it seems like these seals take time to develop, perhaps. And so we've got a tribulation that's seven years, and we've got these seals that seem like they're spread out maybe over years. Seven seals, seven years. Just stick with me on this idea. Um, but then... At the breaking of the seventh seal, it unleashes seven trumpet blasts. So the seventh seal is actually seven trumpet blasts. And each one of those blasts is another judgment. The seventh seal opens up seven more judgments. So what what I believe is that we will see these seals gradually open And then on that seventh seal, we will see things go quicker in these trumpet blasts. You follow my logic? These trumpet blasts are also judgments, and they seem to come at a higher frequency towards the end of a seven-year tribulation. If the seals broke at a rate of years, then these trumpet blasts seem to come more like a rate of months or even weeks. In other words, it gets worse. Y'all follow me on that? It gets worse. Hell, fire, blood fall like rain with these trumpet blasts. A mountain falls into the sea and it turns one third of the ocean into blood and kills one third of sea life. There is something called, I don't know what else to call it, Jeff, but demon locusts. They've got teeth like lions and like the face of people. And it's, woo, freaky stuff. Demon locusts, worse than the mosquitoes, man, worse. One third of the world is going to be killed by fallen angels. This is a trumpet blast. On the seventh trumpet blast, seven bulls filled with the stored up wrath against the people of God or poured out on the world one by one. Remember the seventh seal opened up seven trumpet blasts. Well, the seventh trumpet blast opens up seven more judgments. And these are so bad that your Bible constantly at this section says, whoa, whoa, whoa. I feel bad for anybody that's going through this. Whoa, and I want you to understand what's in these bowls. What's in these bowls could be called the wrath of God, but really what they are, it is the wrath that God has stored up for the evil done to his people. The evil that the enemy has done to you, he has saved it. And it's in a bowl. And it's gonna be poured out in judgment on the world. All of this is an effort to show the world that God is God and he means what he says. So these seven bulls, they seem to be at a higher frequency. If the trumpets took place at weeks or days, these terrible bowl judgments, they might come quicker. They might come at days, they might come at hours. But I want you to see the faithfulness of God, the patience of God, But there comes a time, judgment comes and it comes quickly and it comes quickly. I don't know exactly how, what the time period of these things are, but I feel like they are going to come quicker. They're going to come quicker and it's going to get worse and it's going to get worse. Harmful, painful sores appear on all who worship the Antichrist. That's one of the bowls. The ocean becomes completely like blood. And kills all the sea life. All of it. All of it's dead. All fresh water turns to blood. The sun begins to burn people. Darkness covers all the kingdom of the Antichrist. Large hundred pound hailstones will fall to the earth. It gets worse. It gets worse. And it gets worse. 
it gets so bad that the world willingly turns against God and says, we've got to kill God and we've got to kill his people. So they join the Antichrist as an army and they surround the Israelites to destroy them at a battle called Armageddon. So, is there any hope in this tribulation? It's a pretty, pretty hard stuff. And man, when I built this sermon, I was like, whoa, we're getting dark here. We're getting, whoa, it's heavy, it's heavy. So is there any hope? Is there any hope? Oh, let me tell you. With things getting worse, it's so natural to ask that question. I want to tell you, there is always hope in Jesus Christ. There is always hope in Jesus Christ. Always hope. Oh my gosh. In fact, whenever you're feeling hopeless, you know what you need to do? You need to call on the name of Jesus because it says there is hope. In his name. Somebody say the name of Jesus. Jesus, there's hope in that name. My God. Matthew chapter 12 verse 21 says, In his name, the nations will put their hope. Let me give you some hope. Let's look back at this timeline if we're able to. There is going to be a rapture. Maybe pre, maybe mid, maybe post. But there is going to be a rapture for a prepared bride. Be in that number. Yes, God. Do whatever you got to do to be in that number. I personally lean towards that pre-tribulation rapture, mainly because it catches everyone off guard. It's called the imminent return of Jesus Christ. If the tribulation, if the rapture is at the end, you can almost set your clock to it because it's exactly seven years. But he comes like a thief. So I, that's why I believe, that's one of the reasons I believe a pre-tribulation rapture. But I love you if you're mid and post. Let's make the rapture together. If we are raptured before the tribulation, then we're going to be rescued from this whole tribulation trouble. There's a lot of hope in that. There is a lot of hope in that. But if you miss the rapture, let's talk about that. So let's say the pre-tribulation happens or even the mid-tribulation happens and you like, you miss it. It's gone. And you're like, oh my gosh, now is there any hope for such a person? If that rapture only comes at the end of the tribulation, will I have hope then? I still have hope for you. Watch this. Revelation chapter seven, verse nine. After this, I looked and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people, and language. That's what church ought to be like, by the way. That's right. Every nation, yes. every tribe, yes. every people, every language, every color. Yes. Standing before the throne yes. and before the Lamb, they were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands, verse 13. Then one of the elders asked me, these in white robes, who are they and where did they come from? John answers, I answered, sir, you know. <laughs> good, good response. And he said, back to the elder, these are they who have come out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb. You listen to me. If somehow this video finds its hands in, find its way into the hands of somebody who missed the rapture is definitely in the middle of the tribulation. You listen to me. There is still hope. There is going to be a multitude so large that no one can number it. And they will have their, their garments cleansed in the blood of the lamb. And that group will make it out of this tribulation. You listen to me. That's hope, y'all. That's hope. Regardless of where we are and what the truth is on when the rapture is, the truth is that the hope is in Jesus Christ. Do not ever lose your faith. Do not ever let the devil steal your faith. Let him take your car. Let him take your home. Let him take your health. Let him take anything. But you can't have 
my faith. Do not ever lose your faith. Even if you miss the rapture and you find yourself in this great, terrible tribulation, keep your faith. Keep your faith. Somebody say, keep your faith. The world is getting worse. And only one thing can change this. Only one thing can change this. When Jesus arrives, things get better. Say that sentence out loud with me. When Jesus arrives, things get better. Man, I'm willing to stand on that. I'm, I'm not totally sure on when the rapture is, but that I'm willing to stand on. When Jesus shows up, blind eyes are opened. The dead are raised. That's when Jesus shows up. When Jesus shows up, multitudes are fed. When Jesus shows up, storms stop and demons run away. They beg to go into pigs when Jesus shows up. The, those that are lost and forgotten, they become found and they become saved when Jesus shows up. I want to tell you that outcasts find a purpose when Jesus shows up. My gosh, when Jesus shows up, he puts an end to this tribulation. He does. When he shows up, he puts an end to Satan's antichrist and false prophet. Well, you know what hell is? The lake of fire? You know who the first two people to end up in the lake of fire are? The antichrist and the false prophet. When Jesus shows up, he puts an end to Satan's plan. And as we'll study in the upcoming weeks, when Jesus shows up, he sets up his own kingdom, and it's full of righteousness, it's full of peace, and it's full of joy. It's full of all the good things of God. Things will not get better until that moment, the moment he shows up. For this very reason, your Bible ends with a prayer request. Did you know your Bible ends with a prayer request? Check it out. It's a... Your Bible asks you to pray. Here it is. Revelations 22 and 20. This is the second last verse. Second to last verse in your Bible. He who testifies to these things says, this is Jesus. Yes, I am coming soon. And this is the words of the revelator. He says, amen. Come, Lord Jesus. That's a prayer request. Come, Lord Jesus. You say you're coming soon? Come soon, Lord Jesus. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. Jesus, come quick. Can I tell you that ought to be our prayer request every day? Add that to your prayer request. Jesus, show up. Jesus, arrive. Jesus, when you come here, everything gets better. Come, Lord Jesus. My God. When Jesus comes to rapture away his prepared bride... Things are going to get a lot better for those who are caught up to meet the Lord in the air. It's going to be so much better. I want you to think for a moment about the heartache, about the suffering, about the disappointment. Weigh that in your hand and then just realize the moment Jesus comes back for you, poof, that's gone. It's gone gone. It's going to be so much better for you. And when Jesus shows up at the second coming to fight the battle of Armageddon, things are going to get a lot better for those believers who are present on the earth. My final thing I want to bring to you is this idea. We do not have to wait for that day. When he shows up today, when he shows up right now, things get better. We're about to spend some time worshiping and talking to God. And I don't know what you've got going on in your life, but Jesus is about to show up. And every time he shows up, things get better. Do you want better? Let's invite Jesus into our life right now. They're going to sing as, as we just spend this time in worship. I would invite you to come forward and, and pray and come to talk to God. If you want special prayer in this place, come up to the front of this stage and we will pray for you. We will believe a miracle 
for you. You watching and listening online, come on, don't miss this moment. Allow Jesus to show up in your life. He makes all things new. He makes everything better. Father, I thank you. Jesus, I thank you. You are worthy, Lord, to take that scroll and loose it. Lord, in Jesus' name, when you show up, everything is better. Right now, I invite you to show up in this place. Lord, I invite you to touch every heart in this house, God. Lord, I invite you, Lord, to minister to us, God, to lead us and guide us in this house, Father. In Jesus' name, Lord, we thank you, Lord. Lord, we worship you, Jesus. Lord, we thank you, God. You are so holy. You're so wonderful. If anybody's going through trouble right now, Lord, I want them to find the answer in you, Jesus. Come, God, and be the light of our world, God, in Jesus' name we pray. Come on, let's talk to the Lord in this house, in Jesus' name. Come on, I want somebody to pray for. Anybody want prayer in this place? Tony, can I pray for you? Here comes the glory of the Lord, sweeping in the room. Here comes. Glory, here comes the glory of the Lord. Here comes the glory, here comes the glory of the Lord, sweeping in the room. There's a holy expectation rising, rising in. With great anticipation, Lord, we know, we know our God will move. Faith is rising, hearts are burning as you're drawing near. Here comes the glory. Here Here comes the glory of the the glory Here comes the, the glory, glory of the Lord sweeping in the room Here comes the glory Here comes the glory of the Lord Here comes the glory Here comes the glory of the Lord sweeping in the room There's a holy expectation Mm -hmm. rising in the room with great anticipation. Oh, Lord, we know our God will move. Faith is right. Hearts are burning as you're drawing near. Here comes the glory. Here comes the glory of the Lord. Here comes the glory. Here comes the glory of the Lord. Sweeping in the room. Here comes the glory. Comes the glory of the Lord. Here comes the glory. Here comes the glory of the Lord. Sweeping in the room. There's a great expectation rising, rising in the room. With great anticipation, Lord, we know, we know our God will move. Faith is rising, hearts are burning as you're drawing near. Here comes the glory. Here comes the glory of the Lord. Here comes the glory. Here comes the glory of the Lord. Sweeping, sweeping in the room. Here comes 
the glory. Here comes the glory of the Lord. Here comes the glory. Here comes the glory of the Lord. Sweeping in the room. Thank you, Jesus. Here comes the glory. Here comes the glory of the Lord. Comes the glory of the Lord. Here comes the glory of the Lord, sweeping in the room. Here comes the glory. Here comes the glory of the Lord. Here comes the glory. Here comes the glory of the Lord, sweeping, sweeping in the room. All over this house, can we clap our hands to the Lord? God good. Oh Jesus. Oh. The devil always likes to like rain on your parade. <laughs> right? I mean, uh, you get an amen on that. It, but man, he hates it when Jesus shows up. Cuz Jesus ruins everything for that dude everything everything all the tears that he made you cry the lord is going to wipe them all away every loved one that the devil has put down in the ground the lord's going to rip them out of the earth he's going to bring them back to life he's going to undo everything that the devil has tried to do Everything. In fact, there is a, you, I talked about the middle moment in the tribulation. It's when he stands in the most holy place and he worships himself as God, the devil, right? There's a word for that. There's a phrase for that Jesus uses. It's the abomination of desolation. Abomination of desolation. I, I want to tell you something very quickly. All, hey, my kids, stop right now. The Lord wants you to know this. Listen, all the devil can do is desolate. That's right. Right. He can't do any other things. He can't bring life. He can't create. All he can do is bring desolation. And in Daniel chapter 9, I was studying this very recently. It just jumped out to me. It says that the one who makes desolation will become desolate. Look it up. It's talking about the Antichrist. It's talking about Satan, the one who all he does is bring desolation. You just wait because you, my friend, are going to become desolate. That's his future. And he's got no other future. There's nothing else he can do desolation and becoming desolate himself but we who follow jesus he says we receive life and we receive it more abundantly but we receive hope and we receive peace and we receive truth and we receive justice that the one who's done all this on the hammer fist of god's justice is going to come down on him isn't God good? Can we thank the Lord real quick? God, thank you, God, for your goodness. In Jesus' name, God is so good for us. He's doing so much for us. We will never know in this life all that God's doing. It's so great. Thank you so much, everybody, for watching us online, being with us, worshiping with us. We do three things when we come to Redemption Church. We do three things when we leave. Number one, we want you to connect with God. Connect with God every day this week. Connect with God. Say it. Connect with God. Number two, connect with other believers. There are other believers. Find them. Connect with them. Talk about what you're studying. Talk, talk about prayer. Talk about Jesus. Lift up what Jesus is doing in your life. Connect with other believers. And number three, connect other people to the love of Jesus. When you run into other people, you have one goal, and it's to connect them to the love of Jesus. Yeah, but what if somebody's like doing really mean things to me? That's still your goal. Your goal is to connect them to the love of Jesus and you'll, you'll be surprised 
that sometimes somebody means you harm, but you treat them in such a way that it actually brings them to Jesus. Connect other people to the love of Jesus. Amen? Isn't that good? This week, our connect groups are going to be meeting together on Wednesday. We're going to be meeting at a park. We're going to be meeting outside. Pray for cooler weather in Jesus' name. But we're going to have first Wednesday worship this Wednesday, 7 p.m. There's going to be food. If you can meet with us in person, please do. If you can't meet with us in person, we're going to be live streaming it on Facebook. We want you to be a part of it. That's happening this week. Gracie is, we, God has done wonderful things for us. We've got three ladies that have, that have been pregnant. We've got one left. The other two have perfectly beautiful baby girls. So let's pray for Gracie. Gracie, we love you. We're praying for you. We're praying for that sweet baby in Jesus' name. God bless every one of you. God is so good. We'll greet one another in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. For more information about redemption, look us up online at redemption-church.com. We want to hear from you, so be sure to connect with us on Facebook, Twitter, or even our anonymous question text line at 214-856-0550. Thank you for joining us and have a blessed day.